uh, just about five o'clock, and um, we're going to get started here shortly. My name is Tim Brigham, and I'm the chair of the House Energy and Technology Committee, um, all of which you have here. We have one member, I'm sorry, who's missing tonight, but um, uh, so there are eight of us. We usually have nine. Um, so uh, I want to thank you all for, for showing up on what is probably the nicest day of the year. Uh, I, had, I had asked the, uh, the sergeant at arms if we could hold this on the front lawn and just told him no. So, um, so it's ever in the darkest room in the Capitol today. Um, so as you know, um, what we're here to discuss today and to hear from you about is um, are our three bills that are before uh, the House of Representatives right now, keep in mind, um, H51. H-175 and H-214, which um, generally how I would describe them are different flavors of how we might address or restrict uh, fossil fuel infrastructure development in the state of Vermont. Um, our committee has taken testimony uh, uh, from about a dozen witnesses in recent weeks, uh, some attorneys who have been involved in the Vermont gas case, um, uh, the attorneys who have drafted these bills in the legislature, We've heard from folks who represent the fossil fuel industry, we've heard from climate action um, activists, and um, uh, as I said, about, about a dozen people so far. Um, very specifically, I want to state that we're, we're holding today's um, hearing to give members of the public and uh, essentially a forum to speak to this committee, understanding that you might not be able to get to the State House. Most of the, uh, most of the work we do in the State House is between the hours of, of nine and five, and Knowing that most people and most students, particularly, can't uh, get to the state house, then is why we're doing this uh, hearing in the evening. Um, the most important part about this hearing for me and for my committee is to hear from members of the public about this issue, um, and that's, that's why we're here tonight. Um, to that, uh, uh, in that regard, I wanted to mention we're probably going to have time for about 60 people to testify over the next two hours. Um, we've had uh, at last count, about two dozen people offer written testimony, um, which you can do by um, emailing our committee clerk, um, or I'll give you the email address right now. You can um, send written testimony to testimony at uh, leg.state.vt.us, um, and that is something that we will post to our committee website. And so whether you're not interested in testifying today, or because you only have two minutes and you have more to say, if you'd like to offer testimony, I would encourage you to, to offer that. That is something that members of our committee will, um, will read. Um, and then um, finally, in order to ensure that we uh, are able to hear from as many witnesses as possible in the next two hours, we have rules of kind of procedure for public hearings um, in the State House. Um, how we're going to operate over the next couple of hours is Representative Sebelia has um, the list of names for people who signed in and want to testify. Um, we have two lists, um, those who are interested in speaking in favor of the legislation that um, is before the House right now, and the list of people who are, um, who are opposed to that legislation. We will go back and forth between those two lists until we run out of names on one list and then just continue on with the, uh, with the other list. And as I said, we're hopeful to get to you know, up to 60 people in the next two hours. Um, the, what we're going to do is, uh, Representative Sebelia will call two names, um, the person who is going to testify for two minutes, and then the person who's on deck, who can come up and sit in the um, chair here, and we'll, we'll uh, rotate on that through the uh, two hours. Um, uh, we have a timekeeper. So our timekeeper is, is on this uh, screen right here, and, and Sarah uh, Tewksbury, who's our committee assistant, will be keeping time. Um, I don't know how loud the bell is when two minutes uh, elapses, but you'll, you'll know when your time is up. And I appreciate it if people could um, stick, to their, uh, stick to their time. Um, there are no signs or banners uh, allowed in the room, and I know uh, people were asked to leave those in the hall, so appreciate you um, abiding with that. Um, so, We'd also uh, ask that there be no disruptions in the hearing and to respect the people who are offering testimony. Um, no cheering, no clapping, no hissing, no booing, whether you agree with or disagree with people who are testifying. Uh, the, the point is, is that we want people to feel safe here and not intimidated by um, folks who might not, uh, might not agree with them. So 
we appreciate your, um, uh, your complying with that. So I think those are the rules of the road. Uh, Representative Sevilla, if you want to call our clerk. So oh, the, the other thing I just want to mention briefly, um, uh, Orca um, Media is televising this uh, live. Um, if there are folks who were not able to fit in this room, there's a live streaming going on right now up in the cafeteria, or if someone feels the need to leave and uh, it gets too stuffy in here for you, whatever, um, you're welcome to go up to the cafeteria and, and watch it during the live. So, thank you. Okay, first up, we will have Julie Makuga from Burlington, and on deck is William Anger from Johnson, Vermont. <coughs> My name is Julie Masuga, and I support the bills before you. I organize fossil fuel resistance with 350 Vermont, a job which, like the fossil fuel industry, should have been obsolete decades ago. I'll start with a happy belated birthday to Vermont Gas's pipeline extension, which just turned two last week. A lot has happened in this project's lifetime as it forced its way through the state with threats of eminent domain. 41 miles of haphazard construction that is now subject to an expanding construction investigation, which may cause it to shut down entirely. The price tag has nearly doubled to $165 million, which adjusted for the ratepayer cap comes to around $50,000 per customer. Good thing it wasn't federally, federally regulated or the funding scheme would have been deemed illegal. But let's go beyond the federal. Let's talk global. I constantly hear how Vermont has such a small footprint compared to the rest of the country. True, but does that recuse us from taking action? Fracking is banned in Vermont. We ethically know the implications, the lives cut short or never brought into this world at all. But importing fracked gas seems to be okay with us. How many miles and degrees of separation does it take before we forget what we're doing? Why should it matter if it comes from eight miles away or 8,700 as it currently does? Still, the industry promises to save us with minuscule amounts of so-called renewable natural gas. I sat down with the CEO of Vermont Gas and Representative Cordes, who said, I want to be able to tell my grandchildren and yours that we did everything we could to stop greenhouse gases from ruining their future. Do you feel the same? The CEO's demeanor shifted. I believe he knows fracked gas is not a solution to the climate crisis that we're in. If you're here, Vermont Gas, I invite you for a second time to join us in this movement. We welcome you. Thank you, legislators, for having the courage to seek elected office, and please use the power that you wield to take up these bills immediately next session. Thank you. Okay, next up is William Anger, and on deck is Beth Champagne. Hi, my name is Will. I'm from Johnson, Vermont. Um, I'll try to be good with my time here. I had to cut considerably amount out, but. Um, Many would argue that social responsibility for the environment needs to be represented by policy put forth by our state's legislature. Our state takes tremendous pride in our environment, natural resources, and track record for sustainability initiatives. While we have the lowest carbon emissions per capita out of any state in the nation, one can make the argument that this isn't an excuse to become complacent. Carbon emissions in our state are rising, and we need to recognize that efforts should be put into lowering emissions and that fossil fuels are inevitably finite. Other concerns include the potential consequences of gas leaks, contaminated waterways, and abuses related to eminent domain. These concerns are valid, and they need to be paid attention to. However, Vermont is already one of the most environmentally progressive states in the nation. Why is there so much emphasis on such a radical proposal that would restrict new infrastructure? There are many concerns and criticisms about natural gas, but one cannot deny that it's an affordable and innovative source of energy. Let's not forget that H51 allowed for existing natural gas infrastructure to exist, which is solely developed in the western border of our state and primarily in Chittenden County. If Chittenden County is reaping the rewards of natural gas, why are proponents of H51 so eager to deny our rural communities of that privilege, especially when they, they would benefit the most from the affordable energy, economic growth, and job development that it would likely bring? The people are right to be skeptical about any legislation that has a profound effect on the state and the people who live here just as people are right to be concerned with climate change and environmental issues. Regardless of intent, each new piece of legislation adds another layer of complexity and its own set of challenges. A bill that restricts new fossil fuel infrastructure is no exception. If we acknowledge that Vermont isn't pursuing nuclear, that we aren't open to new fossil fuel infrastructure, all the while recognizing that we still need energy, what is the alternative? This would leave us with renewables such as wind, solar, hydro, biomass, geothermal, and a few others I've certainly missed. While that sounds appealing to me, I'm not convinced that going 100% renewable would feasibly replace fossil fuels. 
All renewables combined, it would still be challenging and perhaps impossible to match the efficiency or power output of nuclear, petroleum, or natural gas. I'll try to finish up quickly. So I'll ask the question, if proponents of the measure wish to move away from fossil fuels, why not first develop a sufficient renewables infrastructure before prohibiting new fossil fuel infrastructure? Thank you. Elizabeth Champagne, a writer from St. Johnsbury. Better? Okay. Nature is not, as the economists reckon it, any part of the calculation of profit and loss. It's an externality. Yet, at this moment, we must consider that going on battering and impoverishing this earth is a tremendous mistake. The it's time that we drop our human performance as not seize. That's a hyphenated word. Not seeing ourselves as belonging to this earth, not loving it, not recognizing as all our relations, each and every presence in nature, as did the people from whom the Europeans seized this land. As Nazis, and I thank Dan author Daniel Asa Rose for coining the term, we divorce ourselves from the natural world at our peril. C.S. Lewis called modern people men without chests, divorced by tenets of modernity that cut off an honor of, of place, of loving one's own place. And this we will, not, will not serve us. We need to know our lives, especially in relationship to our land and water, air and sunshine. It's time to see that our presence on earth is only made possible by these. And most of all, we need to remember, as Antoine de Saint Exupéry pointed out, that what is essential we see only with the heart. Next up is Edward Gilbert from Barrytown, and our guest is Lucy Gluck from Burlington. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for letting me have an opportunity to speak. My name is Ed Gilbert, Jr. I am from Barrytown, just outside of Barry. I would like to change the narrative in the ex extent of offering the private sector solutions that are out there to presently address this climate change initiative or this future reaching of a climate change goal. Presently, Vermont is the smallest carbon footprint state in the country. Since they shut down Vermont Yankee, they have seen an increase in emissions. But rather than cutting the private sector out of the solution process, I feel there should be more brought to the table and more awareness of the technologies and companies that are out there. I'm just gonna use one example. Renewology is reverse engineering plastics into either diesel fuels, natural gas, methane gas, even petro petrofuels. And I realize that there's, there seems to be a labeling or a false narrative of this being dirty fuels, and it's not offering a solution. I just feel facing everything, we're trying to ban an infrastructure costing jobs that Vermont cannot lose at this present time off of a future projection of a possibility would be a big mistake, especially when you're cutting out the private sector solutions that are out there presently. They're actually providing actual solutions. They're actually removing these plastics out of landfills, out of our waters. The, the seeping process that pollute our waters, they're causing, the, causing some of the blue toxic algae plumes up in Lake Champlain. Versus trying to cut people out of the conversation, you should be definitely allowing people that are providing solutions, creating jobs while addressing this actual climate change apocalypse that everybody's kind of generating fear off. 
rather than generating fear, I feel there should be more opportunity to be brought to the conversation. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me that opportunity. Thank you. Next up is Lucy Glass, and our second is Brian Forrest from Lewis and Burlington. Hi, I'm Lucy Gluck from Burlington. I uh, grew up in Vermont. I spent most of my life here in this gorgeous state, really proud and, and grateful to live in such a, such a beautiful place. I love our snow, our maple syrup, our lakes and rivers, our birds and big bears, and our lilacs, which are coming soon. This is a critical moment in time when we all need to ask ourselves a very serious question. What can I do right now to protect our environment and to make sure we leave a livable planet for future generations? There's no time to waste. Everywhere I look, there are signs of intense climate change. The waters are rising and we can do something about it. I work for a local solar company and talk to Vermonters every day who are ready to invest in clean energy fantastic job. They're choosing to buy solar panels that we install on their roof or near their house on the ground. These Vermonters end up saving money on their electric bills and saving the planet at the same time. It's a win-win situation. There are huge opportunities to expand renewable energy in Vermont so that we can be a part of the solution and meet our Vermont clean energy and carbon emission goals. Doing this work helps me sleep better at night knowing I'm part of the solution. It's time to stop putting money into expanding pipelines that carry fracked natural gas. These have no place in Vermont. Instead, we need to increase our investments in clean renewable energy and energy efficiency. We must stop investing in fossil fuel infrastructure if Vermont is to meet its commitments to clean energy and reduce climate emissions. Although natural gas has been mar marketed as the clean fossil fuel, recent studies have proven that it has a warming impact that is many times higher pound for pound than CO2. In addition, the fracking used to extract natural gas can have devastating environmental impacts. We need to be moving towards climate solutions by investing in advanced renewable energy infrastructure, not continuing the status quo. It takes courage to move in this new direction uh, to get a cleaner and safer planet. I believe you have the courage and commitment to protect Vermont, so please support all the bills, H51, H175, and H214. Thank you so much. Next up is Brian Forrest, and our deck is Lisa Sudner from Montpelier. Good afternoon, I'm Brian Forrest, I live in Williston. I'd like to thank Biddy for holding this hearing and giving me the opportunity to speak this afternoon. I'm here to urge you to pass H51, a ban on new fossil fuel infrastructure in Vermont. When the Comprehensive Energy Plan was passed in 20 and, uh, 2016, we thought we had 34 years to accomplish the goal of switching from fossil fuels to renewables. This last fall, the IPC, IPCC report cut that time to 12 years. We have kicked the can of the climate change down the road to 50 years, and now we have only 12 left. We no longer have an option no longer equivocate on this issue. We no longer let fossil fuel companies spread their pollution and heat up our planet, even when described, disguised as, quote, natural gas, a, quote, transition fuel. Passing H51 will signal, the, signal that we as a state are serious about climate change, will no longer let fossil fuel companies pollute our air, threaten our future, and profit our expense, and we will protect our children and grandchildren. Hi, um, I'm Asa Skinder, and I've spent my whole life in Vermont, grew up in Montpelier, and I'm a student at Middlebury College. And I guess I'm just going to start out being blunt with this. Most of the people here, most of your colleagues, most of the people in the room are probably going to be dead before we feel the worst of this. We know we have 11 years to combat this. The IPCC has told us this. It's completely unacceptable for Vermont to continue down a road where we're encouraging new natural gas fracking, fossil fuel infrastructure. So um, for the state to do the only responsible thing, we have to support H51, H75, no new uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, and absolutely no eminent domain. That's just unacceptable that the state would allow people's land to be stolen by 
corporations who want to pollute our land, our atmosphere, and reduce the lives and livelihood of myself, my children, people down the line. Um, I mean, on the front steps of the State House, we have the statue of Ethan Allen. He got started because his land was stolen. It's absolutely hypocritical for the state to be uh, holding up that ideal while also allowing my land to be potentially stolen um, in a time when uh, Vermont is rapidly losing young people. Um, this is not going to encourage new growth in the state. Um, it's taking short-term gains for corporations, the fossil fuel economy, um, one of the richest lobbies in the world, completely um, irresponsibly ruining our planet. And um, you know, Vermont can move forward. We've seen this with civil unions. We've made the right choice in the past. Do it again. Thank you. My name is JT Dodge. Um, I'm, I stood up the uh, No Carbon Tax Vermont group. Um, I'm here, uh, so um, as far as eminent domain goes, I'm gonna say that if no eminent domain for one thing, no eminent domain for anything. That's where I stand. Um, so uh, H51 uh, proposes to prohibit Vermont from constructing uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. We can't afford to ban fuels based on the existence of greenhouse gases. Vermont produces 0.01% of all of the overall country's greenhouse gas emissions. Sure, our carbon emissions have gone up since 2013 when we shut down Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant in Vernon. What did we expect? However, uh, we remain at 0.01% gradually increasing. There's still, but it's still very low um, when we look at respective to the rest of the states. These types of proposals that ban Vermonters' fuel choices are aggressive and extreme. They present false urgency. Some legislatures have suggested human extinction is on the near horizon. We hear about weatherization as a solution to converting to less common, less tested fuel and service scenarios. The Legislative Climate Caucus will say the very poor will receive tax and fee subsidies. This false urgency can be increased by simply ramping up the climate catastrophe rhetoric. Meanwhile, the middle and lower classes will pay more and more for transportation to drive to work and heating fuel, which are costs they already struggle to control. I sense very little care and concern for Vermont citizens in this discussion. The, legislat the legislative proposers of these carbon tax scheme bills spend more time concerned with the world's welfare than the welfare of the 600,000 plus individuals counting on them in Vermont right here, right now. Yes, this is a concern, but this is not a Vermont emergency and Vermont cannot change the environment. Thank you. Next up is Sophie Montpelier and Tom Beck is Patrick Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sophie Earhart. I'm a student at Vermont Law School. I live in Montpelier, and I'm here to speak in favor of H51 and the other bills, proposed bills, banning um, fossil fuel infrastructure. So I agree with the three stated purposes of the bill, and I'm not going to address the need to reduce our consumption and emission of fossil fuels. I think that's a given. Vermont already has these things in statute. So I want to specifically address the testimony that you heard, um, I heard in your committee last week from the fuel dealers. Um, their uh, testimony moved me. Um, my family runs a third generation small business. And I have no doubt that these businesses are providing good jobs and contributing to the economy and providing them good service that they know their customers, they're hardworking people. Um, we're the same, I get that. So, 15 years ago, our businesses in the ag, not the fuel sector, we sell farm seed. Uh, we saw a lot of the small dealers around us being eaten up by agrochemical giants like Monsanto, Syngenta. We also saw this emerging trend of organic farm seed. So we diversified our business, we transitioned our business, we built an organic warehouse, we hired organic agronomists so we could carry that product line. We started selling cover crops, NRCS mixes. We are doing better than ever. And I 
just want to say I don't think it's the legislature's job to save industries from having to adapt to changing markets. I think that's what markets are about. And Vermont has climate goals. You know, we're not reaching them, but we have greenhouse gas reduction targets in statute. They require action. These bills are part of that action. These actions are going to have market effects, no doubt. And I just hope that these businesses that I, I believe, I know they are pillars of their communities and I don't think they're the bad guys. I don't think we should have that narrative going on in the discussion, but I hope that they can um, continue to provide a useful service and diversify so they can continue operating in a clean energy economy. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to the committee. My name is Patrick Flood. I live in Woodbury, Vermont. Um, I'm here to, sit, to communicate several thoughts. First is that I support these bills. If we can't even draw a line in the sand and say enough is enough and not expand what is actually destroying our world, then I think all is lost. So the idea of limiting uh, fossil fuel infrastructure to me is a no-brainer. But I think we're having the wrong conversation. Honestly, uh, Vermont has really not made that much progress on addressing its, its carbon emissions problem. In spite of all the talk, all the controversy, all the plans, all the money, we are still at the same carbon level that we were at in 1990. We are not, I think, meeting our responsibility to our kids and our grandchildren. I'd like to second the notion of the young person that spoke just a few minutes ago a lot of us are going to be gone. We're not going to live through this. We are not going to have to deal with the, the, the traumatic things that are coming their way. They're going to have to deal with it. They're going to have to pay for it. It's going to be extremely expensive. And so I don't believe that we are meeting our responsibility as parents and as adults by not doing more and doing it quickly. So what I think we should be having is a, a comprehensive uh, discussion and a comprehensive uh, plan to address climate change and carbon emissions. That's what we should be talking about. And I'd like to suggest that it's not impossible to pay for it. Most of the people in the room may or may not know, but the Trump tax uh, bill resulted in uh, the top 20% of Vermont taxpayers getting a total of a $350 million tax break. $350 million that they're not paying any longer. So we have a choice. We can either do, continue to do very little and leave the mess to our children, for them to pay and for them to deal with, which I think is immoral, or we can do what's right and we can act now. Thank you. My name is Jason Kaiser. I have a master's degree in meteorology. I support the bills before you. It is a moral imperative. I'd even define it as a common good to strive for policies and actions that lower our collective greenhouse gas emissions. Building any new fossil fuel infrastructure, by definition, instead increases the state's emissions of greenhouse gases, as it is a fact that methane, 86 times more potent to trap and heat over 20 years than carbon dioxide, leaks from natural gas infrastructure. The following from the Union of Concerned Scientists speaks to one of the reasons in the bill for banning false, new fossil fuel infrastructure. If natural gas use continues to grow, greater investment in fossil fuel infrastructure, including pipeline, processing, and storage facilities will be required. Pipelines typically have a physical useful life of 50 to 100 years and are financed for as long as 40 years. Investing in large amounts of infrastructure carries risk. As increasing public awareness of the dangers of climate change lead to increasing political pressure to cut carbon emissions, much of this costly infrastructure may have to be abandoned long before it ends its useful life. In the parlance of Wall Street, these pipelines and other facilities will become stranded assets. When sources of heating, like cold climate heat pumps, are powered by renewable energy, consumers are not subjected to fuel price volatility. In contrast, natural gas prices are difficult to lock in for any significant duration. For example, during the January 2014 polar vortex, average delivered natural gas prices spiked from 35 to $40 million per British, British thermal units in the Northeast, 10 to 12 times higher than average prices for the prior several years. Finally, 
Increasing our reliance on natural gas as a source of heating could delay the deployment and I would also say jobs found in renewable energy like public climate heat pumps powered by hydro, solar, and wind, putting us at greater risk of failing to meet the level of emissions needed to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. Thank you. My name is Beth Thompson, and I live in Danby, way down in Rutland County. I've been here before at other public hearings and rallies and protests, trying to make the case for what I believe are the only rational steps and possible solutions to our human-made climate crisis, namely to do the radical thing, the hard thing, the not business as usual thing. I've been doing this for the past eight years. You might think a person would be weary of it, and you would be right. But I'm here again today with renewed hope because you, our Vermont legislators, appear to be waking up, paying attention, and becoming willing to do the radical thing, the hard thing, and the no longer business as usual thing. I'll let others give you all the facts about methane emissions, about fracking, about how natural gas is not a bridge fuel, about potential damages to Vermont's natural resources, and safety violations in the installation of the most recent natural gas build out here, and about Vermont citizens who have already suffered the duress and indignity of having to give up their homes to a pushy, obfuscating private company which managed to gain the right and privilege to threaten them with eminent domain proceedings. I'll let others address those things, and I will simply say this. We are almost out of time. We can no longer afford to think inside the box and calculate cost benefits in the usual way. The bottom line is no longer simply an economic one. The bottom line now involves embracing the horrible reality of the science and doing a complete about face in our thinking and our behavior in order to change the predictable outcomes, or at least stem the tide. It means not acceding to fossil fuel companies' advocacy for what they say we need. Believe me, theirs is not an altruistic mission. It's all about profit. What we do here in Vermont does matter, not just in actual emissions reductions we might and must achieve, but also in the effect we can have on the global shift in behavior and economic systems that need to take place to save our species. We must embrace 21st century technology and practices and let go of 20th, 21st century technology and practices and let go of 20th century status quo logic. Please ban new fossil fuel infrastructure. Thank you. Next up is Katie Concannon and on deck is Isaac Vanilov from Middlebury. A couple weeks ago, the salamanders started migrating. On a Friday night, we went out and helped them cross a busy road. The different species have different personalities. The redbacks are fast and squirmy, and the boar toads let you pick them up by their bellies. The salamanders lay their eggs in vernal pools that are dependent on a delicate balance of snow, precipitation, and evaporation for conditions that allow them to survive each year. They and the salamanders are in increasing danger from the warming effects of climate change. Later that week, at a panel with Bill McKibben and a room full of students, we were told that a quarter of us would probably die because of famines caused by climate change. I hear things and read things like this all the time. I didn't cry, but that night I texted my dad a picture of a salamander trying to crawl up my sleeve, and he texted back, he's trying to hitch the safe ride, and I put my head in my hands and sobbed because I thought about what I would be doing in 40 years if I was still alive, and I imagined there would be a moment where I realized that all the salamanders had quietly gone away. And I'm telling you this because there are people dying right now from rising seas and air quality violations and pollution and fire, and no one seems to care, so I'm talking about salamanders. When it comes to fossil fuel infrastructure, there is no reason that is valid anymore, no single excuse that hasn't already been named. In his essay about Guy, Scott Russell Sanders asked the question, how can our hearts be large enough for heaven if they are not large enough for earth? I support bills H51, H175, and H214, and I beg you to do the same. Hello, 
My name is Isaac Danieloff, and uh, I'm a student at Middlebury College. I grew up in rural Pennsylvania, where my family and neighbors were always environmentally minded. Um, this rubbed off on me, and I went about much of my life uh, thinking that having this mindset, um, you know, doing occasional trash pickups, would you know, make the world stay as beautiful as the bubbling streams and brambly forests around my house. But in the past couple of years, especially coming here to Middlebury, um, as I've been exposed to a more global perspective, I've seen how these anthropological systems are having negative effects on the environment, and I've realized that everything isn't just sunshine and rainbows. It's quite the opposite. So from experience at home, I know how it feels to have pipelines tear through beloved local natural wonders. I know what it feels like to have our land and water quality threatened by proposed pipelines. It's terrifying. Now, living in Middlebury and in Vermont as a whole, I don't want to see this happen in my new home. I want large-scale fossil fuel infrastructure to be banned through Bill H-51. I want the ability of companies to strip my neighbor's lands in order to build this infrastructure banned through 175. And I want everyone to be able to rest easy knowing that they have a safe and reliable source of drinking water through Bill H-241. Thank you. Or 214. Good evening. My name is Daniel Batten. I live in Bristol with my wife and 12-year-old daughter. I wish to acknowledge that my testimony is occurring on occupied indigenous land. Last year, my family moved to Vermont from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Scientific reports and our own observations convinced us that the rural Virginia lifestyle we loved was rapidly disappearing due to climate change. We felt that shifting to a northern state in this decade would give us, and particularly our daughter, the opportunity, opportunity to establish ourselves as residents and get ahead of the others who will not have as much luxury in future decades in choosing the terms of their migration. We chose Vermont because we see this state as a beacon of hope for progressive leadership and environmental stewardship. When we first visited in 2017, we saw oceans of solar panels and we heard about how the state had banned fracking, things that seem almost impossible in Virginia. We sold our home, left our jobs, our friends and our family, and have happily established a new life here. We are climate refugees. Many more of us are coming to Vermont in the years to come. I also come to you today as a local coordinator of Extinction Rebellion, the nonviolent climate movement that has captured the world's imagination and attention in the past week. I've never been much of an activist, I'm just a regular person who has come to see that those who <coughs> are shaping public discourse cannot be trusted with the preservation of life on Earth. In my role as XR coordinator, I have traveled around the state and met many other regular people who are tired with leaders who do not act with urgency about the climate. These regular people understand that we must heed the call to come together and save ourselves. I'm testifying today to urge you to continue Vermont's environmental leadership by supporting H51, 175, and 214, not because I think your support will save us, but because the time for excuses is over. The struggle to overthrow our life-denying systems has begun. Are you with us? Thank you. Hello, my name is Carrie Waiter, and I'm an environmental studies student from the University of Vermont. I grew up in Holland, Massachusetts, and just beyond the trees of my childhood home runs the Tennessee Gas Pipeline. As a child, the pipeline was a hiking trail through the woods. It was a place where my siblings and I would go to collect raspberries and explore the natural world. We didn't know that this hiking trail was a clearing made for the tiny fraction of an 11,000 mile plus pipeline spanning from the Gulf Coast all the way to Massachusetts and beyond. The picture I had painted of the perfect hiking trail carpeted with soft grass and lined with plump raspberries was a false, superficial image of what really lay below our feet. Massachusetts retrieves more than half of its electricity from natural gas. Yet methane may be just as harmful, if not worse, to the environment as CO2. Fracked gas produces large quantities of methane, which has 84 times the warming potential of CO2 over a 20 year period. So why is it being presented as renewable and a bridge fuel? How can natural gas possibly be seen as a good investment when methane is the second highest contributor to climate change? Why not skip this so-called bridge fuel and invest in energy sources which actually have considerably lower or almost no warming potential? By utilizing natural gas, we are simply replacing one dirty fuel with another. 
I fear that Vermont's energy fight will move in the same direction as Massachusetts if we don't act quickly. Presenting natural gas as a bridge fuel has blinded the world to the true effects it is having on the planet. Vermont has so much potential to bolster our use of renewable energy and serve as a model for the rest of the country. Additional redistribution of natural gas is an obvious step in the wrong direction. Don't leave this issue on the table for our children to deal with. I'm here today to encourage you to please take up bills H51, H175, and H214 at the immediate start of your next session. Thank you. My name is Julie Kep, and I'm a 20-year-old sophomore at the University of Vermont. A map of my home state of New Jersey, which is becoming known as the pipeline capital of the Northeast, shows a maze of 10 pipelines zigzagging through the state, one being less than two miles from my house, <coughs> flowing directly below Carnegie Lake, where some of my best friends in high school spent hours rowing on every week. Every time I drive to my grandmother's house outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I pass some of the hundreds of fracking wells in the state. Every time I get a glass of water, I am, I am reminded of the 271 water supplies that the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection deem con contaminated by fracking activities. Anytime I go back home, I worry about my grandmother's health, knowing the dangers of living so close to fracking wells. Two years ago, I came to Vermont for the first time. It has since become my second home, and I was eager to escape all the worries I had about drinking clean water and being free of the health effects I fear for my friends and family at home. Today, I am here in support of Bills H51, H175, and H214 to protect the things I love about this state, but more importantly, the well-being of its people and its neighbors. These bills all need to be addressed with urgency and efficiency. Any infrastructure that is built to bring frack gas into the state, thereby supporting the fracking industry, is a large injustice to the future of our state. The new pipeline does already have nine categories of alleged safety and construction violations, and the possible expansion of it is a clear threat to Vermont's environment as well as its citizens. The University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University have both found high rates of heart conditions, neurological illnesses, and low birth rates in people living close to fracking sites. While there is no fracking in Vermont, we are responsible for any health effects or deaths because of the demand that any new pipelines would cause. I don't want a map of Vermont to look like a zigzag of pipelines, but until something is done to prevent new pipelines, the fear of toxic lakes and air will be carried with the citizens of the state. My name is Arthur Blackhawk. Uh, I am a state employee. I've served the state for over 20 years. I'm here not to speak to your heads. I'm here to speak to your hearts. We live on occupied land in Dagana, which is the land of the Abenaki. Life is precious. Life is a gift. Life is a miracle. Everything we see, we hear, we smell, we feel, all the senses around us miracle. Mother Earth gives us life, feeds us, clothes us, shelters us, she nurtures us. She and she alone has born all of us. There is no planet B option here. We ride upon this beautiful blue marble goddess flying through space at approximately 67,000 miles an hour. Everything we experience, we perceive is a miracle. We humans are traveling in space now, seeking life and all forms of life due to its rarity. How do we treat that which gives us life? What relationship do we have to Mother Earth? Mother Earth who has provided life to countless generations of our ancestors. And what about the life of our children and our grandchildren and those still to come? We do not inherit this earth from our grandparents. This is loaned to us by our grandchildren. What will future generations and history say about you and I and what we have done in our time that will impact their future, their life? Life is precious. Life is a gift. 
And I'll close in the words of Chief Seattle. This we know, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Support this bill. Thank you. My name is Brooke Van Buten, and I'm a 21-year-old environmental studies student at the University of Vermont. I'm here to talk about the importance of passing the H-51 bill, which would put a ban on any new large-scale fossil fuel infrastructure in Vermont. I'm also here because I'm angry. I'm frustrated, and I'm confused. Day after day, I sit in my environmental studies classes and learn about what's wrong with the world. Whether it's about the ecological disaster of algae blooms in Lake Champlain, or that former oil and coal lobbyists are now the ones protecting our environment and public <laughs> lands. I've grown tired of learning about why the health of our planet is in a critical state. I know why. It's because people are afraid of change, but we need change. Passing bills like this will allow the student who sits in my seat 20 years from now to learn not about what's wrong with the world, but about, about how we are taking action to make this change. Fossil fuel infrastructure is not safe. Vermont has a two-year-old pipeline that was heavily investigated after a report was released on the natural gas pipeline explosion in Massachusetts last year. This explosion destroyed five homes, injured 21 people, and killed one person. The pipeline in Vermont was discovered to have violations ranging from a lack of documentation to missing parts of the infrastructure itself. This infrastructure also has a huge impact on the warming of our planet. Some fossil fuel companies say that fracked gas is better for the environment than oil or coal because it has less of a carbon footprint. This may be true, but this argument is like saying your house being destroyed by a flood is better than it being destroyed by a fire. The damage done may be different, but either way, you're left without a home. Vermont is my home, and I want my home to be safe and healthy. Passing the H-51 bill will not only help us really reach Vermont's goal of being 90% renewable by 2050, but it will also push us into a new way of thinking about where our energy comes from. Someday, we need to drastically change the way we live if we want our planet to survive. Although someday is no longer years from now, months from now, or tomorrow. Someday is today. Thank you. I'm 19 years old and from Massachusetts. I'm passionate about the environment, mainly the wildlife that inhabits it, and I've always dreamt of being a photojournalist so I can travel to places seemingly untouched by man to document the stories of the wildlife there. But that would probably remain a dream to me and a fantasy to my children. This is because climate change has no boundaries. It reaches everyone everywhere. The pressures people are putting on our planet have led us into the sixth mass extinction. Human-induced climate change is at the forefront of this crisis. And it scares me that people do not understand the reality of this threat. This is why I moved to Vermont. I wanted to be in a place that recognizes the threats that our planet faces and makes efforts to mitigate human pressures on the environment. But my fears for our planet grew, and after moving to Vermont, I discovered that fossil fuel infrastructure is still left, even though it is one of the largest contributing factors to climate change. It may supply jobs, but that will matter in 50 years when life is struggling to survive. According to Vermont's Digger, the state's latest greenhouse gas data shows that emissions have gone up each year for the past four years. Even though by law, Vermont is required by 2028 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 50% of what emissions were in 1990. This means that Vermont vowed to reduce the release of emissions that are contributing to the deaths of innocent animals and people who are disproportionately affected by climate change, but they're failing to do so. If you don't want to feel responsible for the deaths of millions, then passing Bill H-51 would put a ban on any new large-scale fossil fuel infrastructure in Vermont, and Bill H-175 would put a ban on the use of eminent domain to condemn land to construct fossil fuel infrastructure. This would also decrease natural gas usage, which releases methane, containing 87 times more the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. Don't be the reason why the only way my children be able to see a polar bear is in their history textbook. Don't be the reason why they won't know what it's like to breathe fresh air without a mask. 
Don't be the reason why I'm scared for the future. Curbing or banning the construction of any new fossil fuel infrastructure in Vermont is the best thing that could be done right now to sustain life for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Barsto from the Little Village of Adamant, and I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'd like to start by saying that, you know, I really love living in this state. I've been a sugar maker from the early 70s, so I've seen the results of climate change in that time period and how the season has changed, shifted from late March and mostly in April to often in February. Anyway, um, I think it's also easy to say in this, to see in this state that it's a small state, what difference can we make in terms of the magnitude of the problem that we face? And um, I think we're, we have been fortunate that we have been able to lead in other issues um, in the past that make a difference in getting other states to move. On this issue, um, the IPCC report, which others have referenced, it, it came out this last fall, is really way behind. It's based on information that's several years old already. So it's, that's not even current to what's happening. Things are happening at a much faster pace than I think many of us realize in terms of glaciers melting at a rapid rate, and they feed rivers that feed water for people and irrigation for agriculture is going to cause huge disruption um, when these start to go down. Um, we have, as indigenous folks um, pointed out, we have obligations to not only past generations, future generations, and the planet itself to do the best we can in terms of mitigating these things, um, climate change. So I would urge the time, the time is now to draw a line in the sand and say no more fossil fuel infrastructure. We need to shift away from that as rapidly as possible. Thank you, Rick. This is Jane Palmer from Moncton, and on deck is Rachel Smolker from Heisberg. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you for listening to my testimony. I've come to Montpelier today to support H51, H175, and H214. H175 is a bill my husband, Nate Palmer, suggested to Mari Cordes. Thank you for that, representative from Madison County. Uh, my husband and I have been at the heart of the eminent domain issue since January 18, 2013, when we got a phone call from a neighbor telling us we had better pay attention because there was a gas pipeline proposed through the heart of our farm in Moncton. <coughs> eminent domain is a powerful weapon that the gas company uses, and even though they say they won't use it unless they have to, the threat is always there. It is like the gas company comes into your house and puts a loaded gun on your kitchen table and tells you they won't use it unless they have to. <coughs> Meaning, of course, that you can't walk away from the so-called negotiation. You can't say no. My husband and I fought the Na Addison Natural Gas Project for many reasons, not just because it was going to destroy the place we live and grow food and feel safe. Once we heard about the project, we did our research and learned about all the ill effects methane has on our planet's climate and the environmental nightmare that is caused by fracking. We also learned about the sketchy economics of the project and watched as Vermont Gas lied its way into getting a certificate of public good and then eventually built a flawed and dangerous pipeline. <coughs> our climate cannot wait. There is no reason to allow a merchant of a fossil fuel to take land or threaten to take land from private citizens when the ultimate public good would be if they don't build the project at all. Please listen to the people here who speak such wisdom. Thank you. Next is Rachel Smoller. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Rachel Smoker. Uh, I am the co-director of an organization, Biofuel Watch, that works internationally on climate change and land use issues. And uh, I've also been, um, I have a PhD in biology and I have been a reviewer for the IPCC reports for the last few years. But I, don't, I think you all know well that the problem of climate change is very, very dire and we don't need to go into that. But um, I'm going to talk more as a resident of Heinsberg having been uh, at the front of uh, opposition to the pipeline for the last several years. Um, and as you know, uh, there's now an independent investigation into the pipeline due to revelations uh, that indicated multiple systemic violations, lack of compliance with even the minimum federal standards for safety regulations, and not to mention lack of compliance with the promises that were made about construction to a higher standard that were agreed under the Certificate of Public Good that was granted for this pipeline. In light of what we know now about climate change, about methane leakage from fossil fuel infrastructure and, fossil, and fracking, um, it is really incorrect to consider fossil fuel infrastructure of any sort to be a public good. We simply have to acknowledge that's the case at this point. Others have already pointed out the methane leakage problems from fossil fuel and from fracking. Eminent domain is something that I uh, think about a lot, and because I have friends, one who spoke before me and one who's speaking after me, who have faced that, and I have been friends with them and watched what that has meant to them personally to deal with that. Place they love, imagine, you have your beautiful home, you have your beautiful gardens, you have history there, and the gas company or somebody comes along and says, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to have this piece of fossil fuel infrastructure go through the place that you love. And you really don't have any choice about it unless you have tons and tons of money to hire a lawyer. This infrastructure is not safe. The Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Administration reports in 19, between 1999 and 2018, 11,991 incidents, 318 fatalities, 1,304 injuries, and resulting costs over $8 billion from pipeline incidents. That's money that could be very well used for making the essential transition to clean energy. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Nathan Palmer, and our deck is Laura Ward from Heinsberg. My name is Nathan Palmer. I own land and a home in Moncton. I'm chairman of my town energy committee. And I came up with the idea for H-175 when I was at last BCAN conference because I could see a conflict between the state's goals of getting to 90% renewable energy by 2050, while at the same time, our government allows utilities to seize private land for the build out of fossil fuel infrastructure. Any progress towards our state 9050 goal that a town energy committee can possibly produce is wiped out when a fossil fuel project comes to town. This is exactly what happened in Moncton and many other towns. By supporting the use of eminent domain, the state is essentially propping up the fossil fuel industry, which takes us in exactly the wrong direction to reach our state goal of 90% renewable by 2050. The Addison Natural Gas Project was built with a 100-year life cycle span. We can't afford to be investing in for infrastructure that won't be useful once we get to our 90% goal, goal by 2050. At this time in our climate situation, we don't have time to switch from one fossil fuel to another. There is no time for bridge fuels. The fossil fuel era has to end now. At a time when the state has acknowledged that it is in the public good to get to 90% renewable by 2050, the state can also say that it is in the public good to build out more new fossil fuel infrastructure. I am not against the practice of eminent domain. I understand the good for the many may be bad for a few, but when the public good is at the state, if we build out more fossil fuel infrastructure, and the use of eminent domain for building that out, it makes absolutely no sense. It's contrary to our goals. Thank you very much. Next up is your award deck is Susan Mahoney from Monica. My name is Theora Ward. 
and I support Bills 51, 175, and 214. We are facing the biggest challenge of our lives. I think we all know that. And I find it kind of helpful when I'm dealing with something too enormous to really wrap my head around, to come back to some very basic principles of dealing with things. So I'm gonna ask you all to imagine that there's a two-year-old in the room who's running the business. <coughs> what would we do? We would jump up, we would grab the two-year-old, we'd grab the scissors, right? We wouldn't say, you know, maybe, that, maybe I could get some scissors that aren't quite as sharp. And we wouldn't say, maybe I could teach that kid not to run quite so fast. We definitely wouldn't say, you know, if the kid falls, you know, I don't think he will, but if he does, you know, we've got ambulances and doctors and we can fix it. And we wouldn't say, you know, the company that made the scissors said that they're not going to hurt him and we're going to for his life, and we believe them, and they're going to take care of the kid forever. We didn't say any of that stuff. And that's what we're doing with fossil fuel. We've got to wake up and be the grown ups in the room and get rid of the scissors. We're the grown ups. We all know people who are going to be alive 30, 40, 50 years from now. And we have to make the environment safe for them. We have to give them the beautiful world we have. That's our responsibility. That's what they grow us to. They take care of the kids. Someone mentioned earlier the big blue marble. We want to give them the big blue marble. We don't want to give them the big brown marble. We need to do the hard thing and the right thing. And we need to do it right now. <coughs> deathbed. We thought she would never die. Not this great survivor who cared for us, fed us, gave us a home, gave us everything we needed, full of generosity and forgiveness. How could we have missed that she was dying before our eyes. We crawl numbly toward her deathbed. The signs have been there. The very air is suffocating her, too hot and humid to breathe. Her fruitful fields are barren dust the oceans are flooding over her land to her very door. The air is choking her lungs with smoke. The rain is screaming down. The wild wind is dashing to her two pieces. And we ignored the signs, blinded by our hubris. This great being our only source of life is dying, slipping away forever. How did we not see this coming? We could have done something if we 
we had only known, if only we had known, if only we had known in our hearts. Hello, my name is T. Kimberly. As a young person, I am terrified of the imminent climate catastrophe. The infamous IPCC report states that we have 12 years to act on climate change. 12 years to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. 12 years before irreversible feedback loops kick in, propelling us into what scientists have dubbed hothouse earth. In Vermont, Hothouse Earth will look like snowless winters, increased flooding, higher rates of Lyme disease, and repeats of superstorms like Sandy and Irene. It will look like the loss of billions of dollars, the loss of livelihoods, and the loss of life in Vermont as we know it. While the changes seem gradual, climate change is already affecting Vermonters. As informed and educated state representatives, it is your job to recognize these trends and pass laws to protect your constituents from the imminent climate catastrophe. The passing of these three bills help to set a precedent and show that Vermont is committed to combating climate change and to making space for sustainable energy alternatives. All of these people came here today to urge you to pass these bills because we all have different things that we would lose to climate change and to these pipelines. In 12 years, I will be 31 years old, the age that I would normally plan on having kids. However, the threat of climate change has taken this away from me. If we keep going about business as usual, the climate catastrophe will continue to unfold, rendering it immoral and unethical to bring children into this world. So for your own grandchildren, for youth all over Vermont, and for me, I ask you to stand on the right side of history and to please support H51, H175, and H214. Thank you. Except this is Clarissa Sprague, and on deck is Jim Dumont from London. <coughs> My name is Clarissa Sprague. I'm a student at UVM, a coordinator for Burlington Sunrise, and a marcher from two weeks ago. Feet like drum beats on pavement, our song filled 65 miles with hope for change and remembrance for what is already lost. At UVM, as I flip through environmental studies textbooks, it is easy to feel hopeless, despair for a planet that is on fire and drowning at the same time. I had forgotten how many people still care. I moved to Vermont with the hope of studying environmental policy and learning from a progressive state known for bold climate action. However, I find a sad irony that here we are politically spinning our wheels, delaying discussion on many transformative climate bills this session. In my home state, Portland, Oregon has already passed a city ordinance banning new fossil fuel infrastructure. I hope by now you realize the urgency of this crisis as young people are rising up across the globe. We feel this urgency because we can see it. As ash piles up on my windowsill each summer, as Oregon air is no longer safe to breathe, I come to realize that we are not talking about predictions. I've come to realize that we are, we are the grandchildren they were talking about, that we are facing these re repercussions now. For my generation, we have been told all our lives that we didn't create this problem, but it's our job to fix it. But we must scream and shout to let our voices be heard in a system where many of those who will be most affected cannot even vote. Our futures depend on your support of H51, H214, and H175. The world has already begun its transition to renewable energy. Right now, 78 cents of every dollar we spend on fossil fuels leaves the Vermont economy. Instead, we should be investing in renewable energies and creating jobs in state. As a college student, I want Vermont to be a place to live and stay after I graduate. Passing this bill would prove that you care about my generation more than those profiting from a broken and dying industry. The polluted political, that the polluted political atmosphere that suffocates the rest of our country will no longer stand in Vermont 
that promoting fossil fuels and suffering through their consequences is not the life we want to live. This community is here, standing up, singing and shouting, crying and marching, and we need you to hear us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up is Jim Dumont, and on deck is George Gross from Shore. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to testify again on these three bills. I will not repeat the discussion I had in the committee two weeks ago about the lopsided and unfair eminent domain process used in Vermont. I will note, however, that law school professors who are experts in the subject of this bill reach the same conclusion that Nathan Palmer reached. I don't think Nathan has a law school degree and he's not a law school professor, but leading experts on this very field have urged states to adopt bills that tailor eminent domain so that it carries out state energy policies, specifically by prohibiting use of eminent domain for fossil fuel projects while allowing use of eminent domain for clean power projects. The second point I want to reiterate from my last appearance is that H51 is a great bill, but it has a drafting error. It omits electric and other generating stations. The bill as currently drafted only prohibits construction of infrastructure that transports fossil fuel. It does not include infrastructure that uses fossil fuel, such as a new generating station. And in my written testimony, I submitted a sentence or two that would fix that. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to discuss our president in Section 401. Uh, the state of Vermont possesses unpreempted legal authority right now under Section 401 of the Clean Water Act to reject interstate natural gas pipelines and all other energy projects that require federal permits because of their impacts on Vermont rivers, streams, and wetlands. That's right in the federal statute, so it's not preempted. It is federal law. President Trump does not like Section 401, exactly because state authority cannot be overridden by his administration. Therefore, he issued an executive order just a week or two ago that seeks to try to weaken Section 401. He will not succeed unless Congress changes the Federal Clean Water Act, which is very unlikely because it will take a majority of both houses to do that. So my point is that while our existing 401 procedures issued by ANR do need some updating, they do need some clarification, I don't think the committee should worry that President Trump's recent rant or temper tantrum will have any effect on Vermont Section 401 authority or on these bills. Thank you. Next up is George Gross, and on deck is Stuart Flood from Bedford. Good evening, and thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to speak tonight a little bit. Uh, at the, my original notes, I was going to uh, cover terrain that's already been covered multiple times by other speakers more eloquently than I have. And so with that in mind, I'll speak to you more in my role as uh, in the past. I've been a professional as a uh, scientist. And the things that I see from reading the IPC report in depth, uh, principally as an outcome of having the phase two pipeline proposed in the front of our farm. And as a basis of that, I started to uh, do litigation pro se in the docket and discover what the IPC reports actually say about things such as methane and greenhouse gases. And more recently, as you've heard on multiple occasions, the Special Report 15 offered in October this past year. A key takeaway from that, one that has not been widely publicized, is that we as a civilization need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by four to five percent per year for at least 20 years, maybe even to zero emissions. That's a remarkable transformation of our society. I support these bills as a shot across the bow, tactically, to start that process. We need to cap any additional investment in gas pipelines and the frack gases emissions that are coming to the fields that feed those pipelines. I further would like to uh, encourage you to confront those factions in your political leadership who have 
put soft pedal to this issue. <coughs> that in fact, we do not have the benefit of time anymore. If we're to 5% per year reductions in gases, we cannot achieve that goal if we do not move in the next year or two. So I recommend that you get a strategic plan as something that can be durable and execute for multiple decades to achieve just that goal. Zero emissions by 2050. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Stuart Blood, and on deck is Sally Burrell from Bristol. Good evening. I'm Stuart Blood from Thetford Center. If more fossil fuel infrastructure is built, it will be impossible to meet the greenhouse gas reduction goals. But industry reps from Vermont Gas and MG Advantage told you otherwise when they testified here a couple of weeks ago. They told you that switching to natural gas from oil or propane reduces net greenhouse gas emissions. That's not true. They told you that UN climate scientists and the EPA say methane leaks don't cause global warming. That's not true. They told you that fracking is safe. That's not true. The gas industry didn't substantiate any of those claims because they can't. Uh, I've submitted some written comments and I have uh, substantiated these observations. UN climate scientists and the EPA actually say that leaked methane is more than 80 times worse than CO2. The EPA actually found that drinking water supplies were contaminated by fracking. There are almost 700 peer-reviewed articles that provide overwhelming evidence that fracking actually damages people's health. And that's all substantiated by the citations in my written comments. But even if you choose to ignore the methane leaks and the polluted water supplies and the sick adults and the low birth weight babies that are born near frac fracking sites, even if you ignore all of that, there's still no honest way to conclude that more oil and gas infrastructure can be part of the climate emergency response. The pipeline is a 50-year investment. UN climate scientists say we have about a dozen years to cut global emissions almost in half. In this emergency, building out new fossil fuel infrastructure structure is insanity. Thank you. Uh, next up is Sally Burrell, and on deck is Brian Tokar. Thanks for letting me share today. My name is Sally Burrell, and I'm on the Bristol Energy, I'm the chair of the Bristol Energy Committee. Uh, three years ago, I visited my sister and her husband in Seattle. One night, we abruptly woke to a huge explosion, followed by an hour of sirens coming from all directions. We learned that the blast happened in the heart of the Greenwood Business District, three miles from us, and it was a natural gas explosion. In the morning, we rode our bikes over to check out the scene and found the entire Main Street area cordoned off, shattered glass everywhere. Two buildings were completely rubble and many others damaged. The fire was finally doused by mid-morning. Later, we learned that the fire department had sent 67 personnel to the scene. Nine had minor injuries, nine firefighters, uh, and 36 businesses had been damaged. Uh, Greenwood used to be a vibrant scene with restaurants, bars, coffee shops, a bike shop, and a small theater, and were enjoyed by the local residents and professionals. I recall being there at Gorditos with my family, uh, enjoying authentic Mexican food where we could make our own burritos. But since the explosion, the area has not been able to recover the economic and social vibrancy it enjoyed before the blast. Greenwood suffered terribly with businesses leaving and many employees losing their jobs. <coughs> Stressful litigation with Puget Sound Energy dragged out for years. Some received too little compensation for their damages. The owner of Gorditos was homeless for a year due to his losses. 
to this day, there's still a vacant lot where the improperly abandoned gas pipeline leaked and blew up. This story describes one way fossil fuel infrastructure is detrimental to society and our economy. There are many other ways. I won't finish. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for grappling with these incredibly difficult decisions. Next up is Brian Hogar, and on deck is Catherine Bach from Charlotte. Charlotte. Thank you for inviting us. I'm a lecturer in environmental studies at UVM and the author of several books on environmental topics. I'd like to cite three reasons for the committee to pass all three of these bills. The magnitude of the climate crisis, the climate hazards of continuing natural gas use, and the likely very short lifespan of any future fossil fuel investments. First, with climate disruptions increasing worldwide, it is simply immoral to allow any further increases in fossil fuel use. U.S. per capita use is still the highest in the world, and Vermont's emissions are rising. It's time to say no. Second, you've heard about the heightened climate impacts of methane releases. In the early 2010s, the Environmental Defense Fund began investigating methane leaks from natural gas infrastructure with the hope of advising the gas industry on how to be more sustainable. Instead, they found that methane leakage from fracking sites to local distribution networks was a far more systemic problem than previously imagined. Numerous papers have documented that methane leakage from gas infrastructure is leading contributor to climate disruption. You've already heard about that. The figure that in the near term, which is what matters most, methane has around 85 times the climate impact of CO2. So it doesn't matter so much that emissions from burning natural gas are somewhat lower. The expansion of fossil fuel inf infrastructure has to stop, including the prohibition on new power plants as recommended by Jim Dumont in his testimony. Third, and this is much newer research, renewable energy is now trending cheaper than fossil fuels, including gas, at such a fast rate that a rapidly growing number of facilities are likely to become stranded assets, essentially worthless in the not too distant future. This is documented in a recent report that I'll gladly share with the committee. The best way to assure that we don't have Vermont Gas and other companies coming to us in a few years seeking bailouts for infrastructure they can no longer use is to stop their expansion now. We can secure enough sources of genuinely renewable energy locally and from neighboring states to keep energy costs down, electrify more of our transportation system, and move toward a modern, efficient, and renewable energy system. I hope you'll pass these bills. Thank you. Next up is Catherine Bach, and on deck is Gregory Dennis from Cornwall. Catherine Bach from Chalot. I'm here to urge you to support the bills before you legislation that would help reduce continued use of fossil fuels in a time when we must transition to renewable energy to survive. Vermont is a small state, but our actions still affect the big picture. Everyone is affected by climate change, and everyone benefits from taking action to reverse climate change. We all do know people who've had their lives ruined by the effects of recent extreme weather events. I have a close friend, Kate, who I've known since I was in elementary school. We even went to the same college, and one summer we spent a month riding our bikes home after spring semester. We've kept in touch for over 45 years. So I was sad to learn that her husband of 40 years died in May of 2018. They'd raised their family in Paradise, California, and Kate was still living there with her dog, grieving the loss of her husband when the campfire hit on November 11, 2018. 14,000 homes were burned and 85 people killed. It was the worst fire in California's history. Kate's house was one of the homes destroyed. She was at work, but her dog was locked into the house. When she came home, she found he'd been incinerated, along with the house and a lifetime of memories. She was overcome with grief. I joined many of Kate's friends in starting a GoFundMe campaign to help her to afford a new house. But I can't help the millions of people in the world who are affected by climate change as much as I'd like to. Every drop of fossil fuel we burn contributes to climate chaos we are experiencing. So why would we need new fossil fuel infrastructure in Vermont? Kate can build a new house, but the fires fueled by drought, extreme heat, and stronger winds caused by our burning of fossil fuels will continue. Investing in renewable energy is the only way to ensure a future for the next generations. Please support these bills to ban construction of new fossil fuels. And 
you. Next up is Gregory Dennis, and on deck is D. Gish from Sharon. Gregory Dennis, Cornwall, Vermont. I, I thank the committee members for your service to Vermont and Vermonters. I know being in a legislature involves long hours and low pay. I support the proposed restrictions on eminent domain and a ban on most new fossil fuel infrastructure in Vermont. Uh, I think we need both. It's not enough to uh, uh, restrict eminent domain uh, as good an idea as that is. We need to act uh, further to uh, ban most, most fossil fuel infrastructure. For the past 28 years, I've run a business consulting firm, so I tend to think in terms of business. And it's clear to me that climate change and burning the amount of fossil fuel we burn is very bad for business, especially for Vermont businesses, most of which operate on narrow margins and are increasingly subject to our unpredictable and vulnerable, uh, are increasingly subject to our unpredictable weather patterns due to climate change. Smart businesses and smart governments plan for the future. You look five to 10 years out. How can we meet the challenges that can we, we face? How can we take advantage of our opportunities? They don't build dangerous and outdated infrastructure. They don't rely on outdated and dangerous technology. We really need to start now to decarbonize. The technology exists. There is a lot of job opportunity for Vermonters in decarbonizing and electrifying. That's how we will heat our homes and run our appliances. We don't need gas. From a business perspective, it's very clear that climate change threatens our maple sugar industry, our ski industry. I'm a skier, and I love to be out there, and I know that in a few years there's not going to be enough snow. Uh, and our agriculture is also under threat. Switching gears for a moment, and lastly, I want to say that, I want to stress to you that there's a lot of impatience building in Vermont about the legislature's role on climate change. We hear a lot from legislators about climate change. We haven't seen substantial action. These bills give you the opportunity to take that action. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Next up is Dee Gish, and on deck is Laura Simon from Hartford. Uh, thank, uh, my name's Dee Gish, and I'm from Sharon. Thank you, Chairman Briglin and members of the committee, and happy Earth Day yesterday. Don Rendall, the CEO of Vermont Gas, was exactly wrong when he testified recently that natural gas infrastructure, quote, can and will play an important role in Vermont achieving its clean energy goals. <coughs> Vermont's comprehensive energy plan goals include meeting 90% of our total energy needs with renewables by 2050. So there's no room for fossil fuels in this equation. By prohibiting the build-out of new fossil fuel infrastructure, Vermont can focus on building the renewable energy infrastructure that's urgently needed to reach our goals. The science is clear. The recent IPCC report says we only have 12 years to make dramatic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions or face apocalyptic consequences of climate change. That's here and now. This new normal was evident during last week's heavy rain events that flooded road roadways, homes, and businesses across the state. Climate change is expensive. Town budgets, such as in Sharon where I live, cannot cover the costs of the extra road repairs and culvert replacements that are required from these increasingly frequent flood events. I work at the Two Rivers Regional uh, Commission where we recently completed round one of Tropical Storm Marine Matching Grant Buyout Program. This effort took nearly eight years and cost just the matching grant portion $4 million to purchase 150 homes and businesses keeping those lots free from development and further flood risk. There is an increasing likelihood that Vermont will face another Irene due to climate change. What world do we want to leave our children? My son, a junior at UVM, has sadly resigned himself to a climate changed world. In a recent column he wrote for UVM's Headwaters magazine, he notes that climate change is, quote, a plateau of consistent elevated tension and intensity entangled with everything from ancient geological deposits to consumer capitalism and the day-to-day -day reproduction of culture. Let's work to change our culture from the reliance on fossil fuels into one of community and hope. Thank you. Next is Laura Simon, and on deck is Barbara Burnett from Montpelier. 
Hi, I'm Laura Simon from Hartford, Vermont. I've been a social worker for 30 years and a teacher for 10 in a few areas in Vermont. I'll focus a little bit on safety of fracked gas and on moving this legislation on. The explosions in Lawrence, Mass. remind us that gas pipelines are aging, they're dangerous, and sometimes cause fatal accidents. A November 2018 USA Today investigation of gas pipelines told us about showed that there's um, spotty oversight and lack of transparency. Um, methane, as you've heard many times, is definitely more serious an issue than carbon dioxide. I attended the stockholders meeting for um, the parent company for um, Vermont Gas, and the CEO repeatedly told us that fracked gas is safe. I walked here with over 300 folks last week. I helped get town referendums on no new fossil fuel passed. Yet legislators say we have to wait because we don't have the votes to pass these bills. So what, what if we find ourselves in the same place next year? We need to act on this immediately. The climate is not getting better, and there are high stakes for Vermont, as you heard, of skiing, maple syrup, and the whole thing. Legislators argue there were other bills that uh, were voted on before there was enough support, and those bills were held back for years. Well, I just talked to staff of someone in this building, a reliable source that said um, there was a bill, Death with Dignity, that wasn't passed the first year, but the next year it was because constituents had a chance to talk to their legislators. We need to know where our legislators stand. Either vote these bills out or do a non-binding public straw vote so we have that transparency, so we know where our legislators stand, and we want to know where they stand on climate. Thank you. Thank you. Up is Barbara Burnett, and on deck is Sage Berber from Brookfield. Um, I'll have to get her, she's just out in the room. Um, yeah, my name's Barbara Burnett, I live in Montpelier. Um, since I know that none of the three bills have made it out of the committee, I'm assuming that they won't be voted on in this session. Well, I can't say I'm surprised, I'm heartbroken that the state has apparently had a crucial opportunity to begin the immense task of responding to the climate crisis slip through your fingers. Is that because few legislators have yet to fully grasp the seriousness and the urgency of climate change? Have even those who say they're aware of the scientists' warning actually taken their words into their hearts? Folks are facing a climate emergency. It's basic physics the natural laws that govern our universe. Physics doesn't care if you believe in climate change or not. Physics doesn't care about your budget loads. And most importantly, physics does not negotiate. If you ignore the rules of the physical universe, you will suffer the consequences of doing so. According to the IPCC report that was issued in October, we have now only 11 years left to dramatically reduce our carbon emissions worldwide. Unfortunately, that's way too conservative. Jamie Hine, who is co-founder and program director for 350.org, has said it's the watered down consensus version. The latest science is much, much, much more terrifying. Even in the last few months, there's new scientific studies that are really almost daily, documenting that our planet is heating up even more rapidly than was projected last fall. We have even less time. We have no time. Um, the time for political posturing is over. We need to pass these bills. And frankly, if we really wanted to be uh, take tackle the seriousness of what we're facing, we need to declare a climate emergency like some cities have already. And we need another session of legislature to reconvene to deal with bills that will actually deal, like some other people have said, with the with the actual issues. <coughs> Um, transportation and agriculture and everything like that. We're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Sage Barber. On deck is Brenda Jacob from Burlington. Hey, um, I'm Sage and this is my son Jamie and I have a daughter in the cafeteria, Lily. Um, and I'm here because I am worried for my children and my grandchildren. I can't even imagine the world, and my great-grandchildren, if they, are, if they exist, 
that they're going to have. Um, we just can't imagine what it would be like. I was thinking the other day, like, is my are my children going to try maple syrup? Like, that's like the best food Vermont has, and that's like a small thing. It could be very scary for them. Um, you know, people might die with the changes in the environment. We don't even know what it could look like, and I just. I just worry for them. Before I was a mother, I wasn't as involved in this, but it's helped me understand, you know, the seven generations sort of thing we hear of, like thinking forward. And I, I think, I don't know, that's all. So um, I really support H51 and H175 and the other one, but I don't remember what, H214, I don't remember what the number was, but I'm sure you've heard it a lot, so you'll know what it is. Um, the, I think these are small steps, and you have something to say. And I'd like to, I'd like to see um, that small step, but we're, we're going to have to do a whole lot more as a society, <laughs> or or leave it for them to do. So, so in the last part, if not for me, do it for Vermont's future generations and like little people, Jamie. That's why I brought him. Sorry if he was a little noisy. <laughs> yeah, thank you for listening. Next up is Brenna Regan, and on deck is Alan Alice Messenger from Burlington. Hi, my name is Brenna Regan. I'm an environmental student at UVM. I'm also a part of a family supported directly by the fossil fuel industry, and I'm also here to strongly support the three bills before you. H51, H175, and H214. When my father lost his job in the 2008 economic recession, my mother has supported my family in the plastics and crude oil industry, most of my college education as well. However, three things have become clear to my family. First, we have to listen to our generation about what we need for our future. Second, the volatility of the fossil fuel industry is clear. And third, the transition away from fossil fuels is necessary right now. I live in the clean city of Burlington, a place prized for being electrified by 100% renewables. Yet, this is not the case for our heat, our cars, or our rural communities. The comprehensive energy plan required by law writes that we need to source 90% of our energy need with renewables by 2050 yet we continue to devote our resources to million dollar pipelines, which are meant to last at least 50 years into the future. With the CEP's goals in mind, this would be a waste of money and stunt the transition to renewables that Vermont is looking toward. The Energy Action Network also reported that Vermont's air pollution has risen since 2013 due to fossil fuels, falling short of the Paris Climate Agreement, a commitment made by our governor. Um, while the pipelines that we currently have carry natural gas to many homeowners and local businesses, the so-called clean fossil fuel fails Vermont's climate goals. For example, by 2014, methane was causing about 25% of global warming on the planet. <clears throat> Again, I'm here to strongly support the passing of the proposed legislation against fossil fuels, H51, H175, and H214. I'm here today because I'm scared. I have a vision in my head of a moment 30 years from now. My daughter is now 14 and 19 years old, have grown up and had children of their own. I have more gray hair than I have now. My grandchildren ask me about what Vermont was like when I was young. And after I tell them about sneaking in a ski run before work in November, or going to their mom's soccer game during April snow flurries, they ask me why it hardly ever snows anymore. And then I break into a cold sweat because then they ask, why did everyone keep burning fossil fuels when they knew it was heating up the planet? The trouble is, inaction on climate is rewarded by our legislative process because choosing climate means taking the long view. Longer than your term in office, longer than your life, longer than my life. 
I want to be able to look at my look my grandchildren in the eye and tell them a different story. I want to tell them that 30 years ago we got scared and that then we made a change. It was a change that took courage and leadership and it started right here in Vermont. You may be thinking that you're already making changes, perhaps around weatherization or other important aspects of the climate crisis. But why I support H51, H175, and H214 is that every dollar we invest in pipeline infrastructure delays our transition to renewable energy. Some of you will have a similar conversation with your grandchildren in 30 years. What do you want to tell them when you knew you had the chance to act? Douglas Smith, and our deck is Thomas Cuneo of St. George. <coughs> My name is Douglas Smith, <coughs> I live in Sharon. <coughs> I looked my grandson in the eye a couple of weeks ago and I said, Jet, you think I'm getting too worked up, too like crazy about climate chaos? You think it's too much in my mind? You think I'm like off the wall? He said, Grandpa, no. Can't be too worked up about climate chaos. He's a high school student, high school senior. He said, We're all in high school, one way or the other. We're either so depressed about it or so angry about it. I was teaching about greenhouse gases and their effects 50 years ago in a course <clears throat> at a well-known college to undergraduate students in which we talked about greenhouse gases and climate change. And at least some of the students got quite upset and actually set out on a <clears throat> career that where they never forgot about that. We didn't know all of the science. We knew the science, but we didn't know the details. And I went in, in, in the 1970s, that was 50 years ago, so in the 1970s, I became an international energy consultant on renewable, rural and renewable energy all over the world. And, <clears throat> And we had a lot of possibilities for actually turning things down and we knew what the culprit was and we knew it was the fossil fuel industry. And in 1980, there was a political change in this country and all of the good work that had been done, all of the new policies that were in place in Japan and the United States were suddenly turned around the fossil fuel industry won, and the whole renewable energy industry went into the doldrums. And now here we are again. The same argument, and we can't even pass such simple bills as these three bills before you. So yes, Jet, I do get awfully worked up. And on deck is Doug Grant. Parents Cuneo, uh, um, the Marsh Professor of Moral Philosophy at the University of Vermont. I want to support the um, bills before you and offer a bit of a different perspective. Uh, my family is among the affected landowners and among the few that entered into eminent domain proceedings. I'm in favor of these bills because uh, I don't want other landowners to go through what we did. Uh, 
describe it as uh, experience of bewilderment and distress. You, you open your mailbox one day and you're told that a pipeline's gonna be running through your property. Um, and you can either accept it with a small amount of money or you're gonna go into eminent domain. It's a lot of questions. What are our legal rights? What are our moral responsibilities? What's, what's our land worth with a pipeline through it? Are we putting our family needles into harm's way? It didn't take an extraordinary amount of uh, foresight to uh, see that uh, this is gonna consume our lives for the next few years, and it did. And hence the duress. Um, you know, we gradually learned that the agencies who wished to take our land and who was going to profit from it had nearly limitless amounts of money, legal resources, and power to get what they wanted. We had none of those things. And as a consequence, to echo something that Jane Palmer said, um, the negotiations felt like, you know, doing with a pistol to your head. You're going to be rolled over. I just want to assure you that this is not an accidental byproduct of fossil fuel infrastructure build out. It's built into the very built into the very process. This up is Doug Grant. And I can visualize it because I have some very specific simple. Uh, Doug is Jeffrey Gardner. Greetings, um, I'm Doug Grant from Putney. I um, recognize many of your faces from the uh, Climate Caucus. Um, Mike and Ricky mentioned this to me. I didn't know this hearing was gonna be here, but I boned up on it just yesterday. Um, I came to your committee a year ago when Mary proposed this, introduced this bill, so it's very special to me. Um, I say I'm from Putney, I've been there three years. Basically, I'm a climate refugee from California. Um, I have a cousin who had to evacu evacuate from the car fire. I have a other family member who's lost everything in paradise. Um, when I left California, I went to Lincoln, Nebraska for a couple years to fight the Keystone Pipeline. I went to Texas, I went to Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, North Dakota, South Dakota, the Athabasca tar sands, and other places fighting pi uh, pipelines. I realized it's not gonna get us anywhere but this, I think, is important. This bill, I think, is a very good start, but I don't support it the way it's written. And what I've given you is three specific changes. We need to eliminate the exclusion for FERC-certified projects. FERC is an arm of Congress, and they do what Congress tells them to do. In 2014, I met with FERC, and I learned what, what their, what their, where they get their marching orders. It is from Congress. And I think Vermont, the brave little state, needs to take a stand for us specifically without having any encumbrances from the Federal Energy uh, Regulatory Commission. Um, so you will see in this package that I'm suggesting that we not exclude FERC in two instances on page uh, three, uh, one and three. And then also on page three, there's a reference to uh, allowing maintenance and repair but we should not allow any rebuilding or a replacement or twinning of any pipeline. Thank you. Next up is Jeffrey Gardner. And on deck is Karen Bixler from Bethel. I'm Jeffrey Gardner from Bradford. Earlier today, I posted by email to the committee this petition signed by nearly 1,500 Vermonters from across the state opposing any new fossil fuel infrastructure and I'll leave it with the committee to circulate. From everything that's been said so far, it's clear that we in Vermont have maybe a little more than 10 years to do what we can to keep at bay the worst consequences, the most dire consequences of climate change. So I think it's important for you to imagine what will the next 10 years be like in Vermont if we don't pass these three bills, and if we do pass these three bills. If you don't, 
I think what you can look forward to is once the VGS recovers from whatever slight punishment it suffers for all the flaws of the pipeline it built, it will build more pipelines. That will mean more painful, costly hearings at the PUC. It will mean more disruption at work sites, as we've seen with the ANGP. And it will mean more people like Terrence and others will be living under the threat of eminent de domain to move them from their homes. And many people will be living in proximity to dangers like those of the ANGP so badly constructed. There also is the possibility that if these bills don't pass, especially given the increase of interest in EVs and other, and in heat pumps, that there will be greater demand for electricity being produced by gas here in Vermont. That is very much what ISO New England has been pressing for for a long time. If these bills do pass, all of that pain, all of that suffering goes away. And at that point, we Vermonters, and I mean concerned and thoughtful citizens at large and not just legislators and officials, will be able to turn instead to the really hard, necessary work of planning and building renewable sources of energy to be used in state with funds that will be kept in the state's economy and not moved away. This will require Vermonters from the local level on up to make careful decisions about energy efficiency and conservation and about land use and the siting of new renewable infrastructure as well as net metering, renewable energy credits, and what could count genuinely as renewable and sustainable energy. In short, it's we who should get to work on these real problems without quibbling about goals or gimmicks to meet them and without leaving the decisions to the big nationwide or international interests who know only how to go on pressing on us the extractive and polluting technologies we know are obsolete and dangerous. I urge you to pass these bills. Thank you. Next up is Karen Bixler, and on deck is Ulrich von Wolfgang, Sharon. Close. <laughs> Hello, I'm Karen Bixler from East Bethel. Most of what I'm going to say, wanted to say, has already been said. It's been a long hearing. You've heard it all. I'll try to be really concise. These bills are not radical. These bills are baby steps. They're a very beginning of saying, maybe we could change our minds about the road we're on, which is obviously going the wrong way, and do something else. It's a very little step. These bills have no financial impact on the state. These bills are not gonna raise anybody's taxes. They're not gonna cost anything. So the biggest reasons to worry about bills are gone because we've collected signatures on this bill and I can tell you I've never seen Vermonters so eager to sign things as they are for these bills. It's a thing that whose time has come. We're living in a changing world and we're starting, just starting to barely comprehend what those changes are. Vermont is finally going to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. Well, maybe we should think a little bit deeper about that and think about people's relationship to the earth and what that means. And that the earth is not just something to extract for our use and our comfort and our luxuries. It is what sustains us if we will let her. I'm not even sitting down. I don't think I have very much to add after all these very important and interesting testimonies. I'm getting old and I want to have someone from the younger people who was prepared to speak and didn't get a ticket to take my space. I think we need to hear more of them. So someone can come up and take my place. Next person will come. Here's a young person. There we go. Yeah,
20 years old from Middlebury, and I'm here to support the bill proposed today. As a young person in this world, I've been appalled and disappointed time and again by the inaction of generations who came before me and the people in power now to limit global emissions of greenhouse gases. The failure of my representatives to take real action against climate change and the fossil fuel industry is a failure to protect my rights, the rights of my family, my friends, and my future. In continuing to support fossil fuels in Vermont, you would ensure that in just 11 years, probably less, according to the report we've all talked about, we would be living in a world torn apart and destabilized by climate disasters. This is not the world I want to live the rest of my life in, nor, it is, nor is it the clean, stable, and just world all citizens of this earth deserve to live in. By passing these bills and limiting Vermont's emissions from, from fossil fuels, we can fight against that version of the future and work towards a society based on renewable energy, equality, and respect for the planet. I want to thank you for choosing to grapple with these issues, and I know you, you will take this, this tiny step baby step to fight climate change and protect all of our futures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Laurel Stevenson, and on deck is Ariel Arwin from Heartland. Uh, I'm Laurel Stevenson from Heartland, Vermont. Um, if I can yield my time to a young person, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I think most of what I would like to say has been said. I certainly think that Jim Dumont has made good corrections to the uh, uh, no, new fossil fuel infrastructure bill. Um, my story is that I came here as not a climate refugee, but as a petroleum refugee from the effects of frack gas, basically. Um, I needed to the fresh air of Vermont to heal, and I got off petroleum as much as is possible in this modern world in the process. And for that reason, I'm not as afraid, I guess, of the transition that we have to make. And it gives a different perspective to it. Um, I've also been keeping track of the scientific uh, literature, which actually is making the 11 year time period look like longer than we really have. Uh, methane release from permafrost is happening now, apparently. Um, so why would we build infrastructure and make ratepayers pay for it uh, that we are not going to be able to use if we want to save civilization? Thank you. We're going to have time for three more people to testify, and I just want to give people a heads up if people want to give their time to someone else. So you can say your name. Hi, my name is Olivia Summers. I'm 19. I'm from Middlebury. And I used to dream about having a family and having children, raising them in the Green Mountains, maybe having a spouse who hopefully knows how to garden, because that's something I don't want to do but can. And now I try my best not to dream about the future. This bill is about more than fossil fuel infrastructure. This bill is about whether the Vermont state legislation cares about the state's future. This bill is about whether the state legislature cares about my future, my family's future. If we can't look to the government to protect us, who do we go to? Who do we look at? Where am I supposed to find hope? Banning fossil fuel infrastructure is the least that you can do. You all know the science. You know about how little time we have. I want to live in a state that prioritizes people over profit. I'm asking you to support bills H51, H175, H214 for my future. For the future of my little sister who dreams about being a teacher, for the future of my friends who have tons of beautiful dreams. I'm asking you to support these bills to stand for the young people of the world everywhere and for the future of the earth itself. Thank you. Thank you. 
next uh, person up is Valerie Deering from Bristol. On deck is Rebecca Dowdquin from Montpelier, and the last is Carl Mayer from Rygate. <coughs> Thanks for letting me speak. I'm also a refugee. There's a lot of us here. I came from Northeast Ohio and Western Pennsylvania where the fracking was everywhere. It was ruthless. I saw what eminent domain did to people. How the oil people went in there and intentionally broke up towns, neighbors, friends, pitted them against each other, and then took their land. They waved a little money in front of their face. People were poor. They leased their land, thinking, oh, I'll get a little money out of this. They got dead farm animals. The organic gardeners and farms were devastated. They had to abandon their land and move. There was a fracking well a mile from my house. I got to go down there every night after work. I'd see the ground ozone ooze out from the fracking well base. <laughs> that stuff will kill you in a second. My cousin lived right across the street. She has two kids. Her husband worked for the frackers. He made the pipe and installed the compressors. His kids were sick. They're still there and they're still sick. Behind me and the rest of the refugees in this room, there's a few others coming our way. My mother on her deathbed told me, Valerie, leave, go to Vermont. I did my research, I had to find a place to go. Vermont was the cleanest place I could find in this country. I'm here, I live in Bristol Village co-housing. We have heat pumps, we have solar. It's what I believe in and I'm proud to live there. And it's the way of the future for Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Excuse me. Next up is Rebecca. I want to make more space for um, indigenous uh, voices in the room to be heard, so Charlie's going to speak. My name is Charlie McGazel, I'm an Abenaki. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, eloquent things here in this room today. Uh, many people think and believe that there is another extinction happening right now. Um, half the bee population in New England is gone. And to a lot of farmers and a lot of people, that means a lot of things have changed. The thing I, wa I want to talk about really is, is uh, eminent domain. Um, you know, its legal concept in the beginning was about the protection of public peril. When things were out of whack and the state needed to take a step forward in order to uh, protect its citizens. And the last time I saw that happen in this state um, was in Irene, when certain regulations had to be put aside so that they could get the uh, stone and gravel that they needed so that towns, cities, and stuff could reattach itself. And, uh, and we can move forward again as a people. All of us in uh, Vermont, in Indakana, which is everyone's homeland, all of ours. We all live here today. In, in terms of the, uh, the fracking that's going on and the emissions that are, that are coming from it, you know, uh, Vermont gas, this product isn't a natural product that comes from Vermont. Why the state would abdicate its authority to utility companies or energy companies to begin with without thinking of such peril that is going on and you hold the protection for all of us. The, the problem is, is that this is happening on First Nation original people's lands where this national natural gas is coming from. And is Vermont um, Gas Company going to be held responsible in some ways for the circle of cancers that are, that are starting up where this original people's lands is, to what are you going to do to hold those responsible? In future, as things change and, and energy changes, 
you know, it's your responsibility to think of the long-term economic effects as well as the social, cultural life that goes on here. And I know you take that seriously. And I know you believe that these bills have come due. And uh, McGwitch, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Chair. Carl Mayer. I'm from Rygate. I migrated to Vermont in 1970, burned some renewable fuel. And the environmental movement had started by that time. And so we had some hope. We demonstrated against Seabrook. Didn't work. But we did learn that there was technology coming that was going to make energy <coughs> renewable for more people than those who, would, who burn wood. Well, I'm very upset. You know, I went to visit my <coughs> nephew in California who had to vacate his home. I went to Alaska to visit <coughs> my daughter who was building houses in Alaska. And they could only build where there was no permafrost anymore. You could fix houses that were built on permafrost. And um, so I'm so upset after all these years. We knew in the 70s, like one gentleman told us before, we knew that there was an answer to this kind of energy production that we had. But we didn't do anything about it then, and we continued not to do anything about it. So I have now five children, and I have eight grandchildren. And that's why I'm so upset seems to be the condition in our country. So in Vermont, we always have a chance to do a little bit better, and I'm sure you will. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> thank you, everybody, for uh, your patience and your stamina. Um, and uh, <coughs> appreciate you being here today. Thank you.